Hey, it's me, JC. I'm your classmate and fellow student here to discuss a topic related to this week's reading on participatory culture, copyright, and getting back to the basics of music. The history of sampling begins with an invention in Germany that recorded content to discs that could then play back the signal in response to a physical action, such as playing the keyboard. This affected pitch and timing of the playback. Remember the Mellotron from the Beatles? Yeah, that was a sampler too. These features are still pronounced in modern day sampling. Some of the prominent brands that became successful in developed sampling instruments include Emu Systems, Akai Professional, and Sonic, Roland, and more. Of course, hardware systems spawned software emulations that live up to the standard of the original systems, the development of which included much research. The MPC brand has become one of the most prominent samplers in hip hop, developing the likes of J. Dilla, Noja Bees, Kanye West, MF Doom, Pete Rock, DJ Premier, Q-Tip, and many more. This remix culture began on vinyl records with turntables and mixers, and that was recorded onto floppy disks that was then recorded to tape. A fascinating process that required time, effort, and most of all, money, cash flow. You can see maybe why some of these rappers and producers all they talked about was cash. Plenty of these systems were used to infringe upon copyright. Most systems had complex capabilities enabling precise transformations. Many copyright holders sued users of these machines when the producers and DJs distributed copyright material that had only been slightly transformed. As the music sampling culture grew, more and more the challenge became avoiding copyright infringement by transforming samples beyond recognition. With the advent of, of the Creative Commons, this illegal activity has become less prevalent. Although the purchasing of samplers and electronic synthesis capable of wavetable functions has not. You can do a lot of these things on the computer as well, so you're not really getting around it. I wanted to show you a little bit more about what it's like to work one of these uh, samplers. So I'm going to give you a short demonstration on this concept of sampling through modifying John Coltrane's Giant Steps, which is currently copyrighted until 2037. Of course, I won't be distributing this anywhere, so I'm going to do this for educational purposes. So when you're using the MPC-1 with this John Coltrane sample, you can do a lot of crazy things. And this is what the original sample sounds like right here. Right, so it's just those three horns, right? And with manipulation through the MPC-1, you can get it to sound like this. Right, so I got some some toms, hats, and snares, and kicks, and this is when you put it together, that's what it sounds like. So I think you get the idea. You can make it sound really different than it originally was. Right, so, you know, once a lot of people started going uh, to, you know, pick up read only material and start using it to make their own stuff. Um, they got copyrighted in front the, you know, were sued for copyright infringement, but once they started creating, you know, like a creative commons for people, most of the stuff that they put on for sampling there, um, probably wasn't really that great either. Right. So, you know, some places you can find really talented people who do put out their stuff into the you know public domain or, or without copyright, but there's not a lot of people that do that, actually. Most people are looking to make a commercial profit off of their stuff, I would Im I would imagine. So so a lot of people, entrepreneurial producers, started composing their own samples of music, usually one or two instruments put together, you know, a synthesizer, a bass, and then offering like a license of these homemade samples to other producers. Now, music's licensing for film and television is huge. And best of all, hip hop has become one of the biggest genres yet, proving that sampling can be both collaborative and profitable, which when applied under the licenses set by original authors, otherwise known as licensors, right? So if you're making your own composures on stuff, then you can make, probably turn a profit on, you know, a platform like BeatStars, which is probably the biggest one. And one that I can kind of stands out to me as a brand that's, you know, been advertised to me even. Go back to the classics. Why do producers use what they use? Honestly, inspiration, right? And think about the Grateful Dead, the people who brought back a lot of music from the you know earlier 20th century and late 19th century. 
in the form of electric blues, which was really cool, right? That's a like almost a part of American history, American culture, of music culture. And I think that they that you have to make sure to respect that and not you know infringe upon people's rights, right? Because you can respect that they can practice it so much. I guess I'm trying to say they, they, you can't, they, they, they're not really respecting copyright law. Right? The Grateful Dead in a way, it's like, from what I looked at, the, the copyright laws, people who die, right, do die. You have to wait until 70 years if they published it with, um, published it with the copyright office after they died. And so you just gotta be making sure that if you're, you know, downloading sampled music that's got copyrighted material and you're using it as a producer, you need to make sure that you either clear it with the rightful copyright holder that's either been passed on by someone who's dead or just don't, or just not use it and make your own stuff, right? So that's what I would advise. So thank you for your time and watching this presentation to get a better idea of how music sampling is integral and in participating in music culture. I'm JC Belfi, and I'll see you next time.